Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm going to crack on, and I would really like you all, please, to give me luck to do this within 25 minutes. Um, so uh, the aims of this talk are effectively to discuss some key long-acting long acting ARV agents. I'm not talking about BNABs and the future um, drug delivery systems. Where we are with studying these agents in children and adolescent populations and discuss some of the key data related to opportunities and challenges about introducing these to pediatric populations. I must make some acknowledgements. I have no disclosures. Um, this work is linked to work I did for the WHO team for their Cardo and Pardo meetings last year. Um, so a huge thank you to Martina Penizato and her team for her guidance and expertise. Um, acknowledge the industry groups listed, um, the Pardo seminars, and the expertise of, of those below. I have nothing to disclose. I must acknowledge myself, just quickly, to say that I'm not a pediatrician, I'm not a pharmacologist. I'm a HIV physician and academic with nearly 20 years of um, experience in London, but also in some diverse low- and middle-income settings. I hope to provide you with um, a more contextual health equity and clinician lens on this data. So let's start with innovation in long-acting drugs. So there's no doubt there is a really quite exciting um, uh, innovation within HIV pharmacology with a powerful potential to improve treatment outcomes for all people living with HIV. The focus has been on greater potency, simplified ART and long-acting compounds to enable alternatives to oral daily treatment. Um, early investigation is seen for these drugs within treatment and prevention. New classes, first-in-class drugs um, for treatment across population cohorts um, living with HIV. There is a leaning towards, though we're nowhere near this, um, towards efficacy and safety trials in um, understudied populations a little bit earlier, pediatrics, pregnant and lactating women. In terms of uh, drug delivery systems, there are also potentially game-changing developments in drug delivery for pediatrics. Um, An innovation um, to think about how you match the appropriate technology with the right product. But what we all need to do as a community is to think about how they actually provide meaningful solutions um, that manage the treatment challenges for pediatric populations and think about how realistic they really are to implement within real-world practice. Um, so just a quick slide, this is just from the iBase, um, a fantastic uh, resource from 2021, just to highlight the kind of innovation in new drugs out there. I'm going to discuss the first five in yellow to, to varying degrees. So I'm going to start with Lena Kapovir. So Lena Kapovir is a first-in-class, long-acting, potent inhibitor of the HIV capsid protein. It comes in an oral and subcutaneous formulation. The subcutaneous formulation has a half-life of about 50, to, um, uh, 50 days to six months. There is in vitro activity against viral strains resistant to the four major um, ARV drug classes and entry inhibitors. There's been deemed no cross-resistance. In vitro and clinical data has demonstrated distinct pathways for drug resistance. One of the first three that you can see the mutations are a combination of them. It's a substrate of the main proteins and enzymes that metabolize drugs, so it can't be given with potent inducers like rifampicin. PK data, um, despite kind of variations in PK data with people who have renal and liver dysfunction, it's deemed not to be clinically significant. Animal studies have already demonstrated its potential efficacy as PrEP, um, and there are now ongoing um, phase one and two trials um, and clinical studies showing efficacy. So I'm not going to go into detail on the study design. We can talk about it later. But um, effectively, there are two ongoing um, trials that have reported to week 52. Um, these involve Capella, which looks at Lena Kapovir, just to say that it's lenacapavir given with oral daily treatment, lenacapavir given six months um, subcut. Um, and in, in that study involves a significant proportion of people who are resistant to all four classes and about 17% effectively had no functioning drug in their oral regimen. Um, both uh, studies have demonstrated high rates of virological suppression up to week um, 52. And just to comment um, that there was emerging lenacapavir resistance seen in both um, studies. There were eight within Capella, um, and this was linked to low adherence and resistance to the um, 
uh, to the oral optimized regimen that they were already on. And there was one in Calibrate, so that's in the naive, um, and that individual um, did have um, drug concentrations within the therapeutic range, but still unfortunately failed. So what are the opportunities for lenacapavir? So lenacapavir aims to be a treatment relevant for, for um, those who are treatment naive and experienced patients. Um, there are studies in pediatric populations planned, and we should get pregnancy data from the Purpose One Prevention Trial. So this is a prevention trial looking at six monthly lanacapavir versus oral PrEP in sub-Saharan Africa that will also include adolescents, and that study will um, allow pregnant women, women who become pregnant on the drug and on the study to remain on the trial. The data currently supports flexing, uh, flexible dosing profiles um, and multiple potential long-acting options with different long-acting agents. Um, but there is some discussion about what currently lenacapavir could be given with in treatment. So if it's given with an oral daily pill, really, you know, what's its main use? Um, uh, and what could it be paired with? So unfortunately, I'll talk a little bit about later, there were plans for investigating it with Islatravir, but Islatravir development has been halted. Could it be flexibly paired with Cabotegravir? That's not been in suggestion or even on the pipeline as far as I'm, can, as far as I'm aware. That would be a new industry partnership. Are there preclinical agents out there that it could be paired with? That may take some time. Okay, so cabotegravir, rilpivirine, long-acting. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. It's the, it's the combination we have most data for. Um, and I just want to be a little bit uh, transparent to say that I will be highlighting some aspects that I think are relevant to think about um, for pediatrics. And they may sound a little bit negative without equal balance to the positives of this combination. So... Um, Cabotegravir, specifically as a novel agent, is a long-acting HIV-1 integrase transfer inhibitor. It's molecularly very similar to dolutegravir. It has a long systemic half-life. There's oral and intramuscular um, formulation at the moment. It has a long systemic half-life and up to 50 days for intramuscular administration. There have been levels detected in the blood for up to a year post-stopping cabotegravir, and, and that will be important when we think about the tail, and up to four years after stopping long-acting wilpivirine IM. Cabotegravir compared to dolutegravir and bictegravir has a low genetic barrier. Toxicity to date has been good and effectively only really related to injection site reactions. Studies now, mainly Atlas Flare, Atlas 2M, that have had over 17,000 participants 1,700, sorry, um, uh, participants have demonstrated that long-acting cabotegravir rilpivirine is non-inferior to oral daily art, and it's now approved and licensed as a, um, uh, in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, and uh, as a once-every-month or once-every-two-months treatment for people living with HIV. To note, rilpivirine um, long-acting requires cold, um, cold um, chain storage, so that may limit its applicability in some settings. So we're now currently in implementation phases. Um, it's, it is being um, slowly and cautiously rolled out to a degree in, in, um, uh, in the UK and the US, and we have the Alana trial in, in, in the UK. There are planned drug resistance mitigation strategy studies planned in sub-Saharan Africa. We're now going to be getting long-term data on efficacy and acceptability in the real world, which I think is key. Um, and just a, a quick comment that um, cabotegravir as IM is PrEP, I see very differently. That, uh, in many ways, is a game changer. It has been seen as superior to oral PrEP. Um, and there is um, already some data for a long-acting um, implant demonstrating efficacy in macaques. So this, this um, uh, slide is mainly um, to demonstrate that... So cabotegravir is given as a long-acting depot and the administration of the IM injection is actually key. And so it is important that when it is implemented that training is given regarding IM, um, which, which should be straightforward. But effectively, um, it's given as an IM gluteal injection. And the LA aqueous, the long-acting suspension is an aqueous um, form that forms a drug depot in the muscle. And then the medications are slowly absorbed from the depot into the bloodstream. And I think some of the evidence that demonstrating how important the IM injection is is that actually if, if you use a longer two-inch needle, then you're getting higher median cabotegravir trough levels within patients with a higher uh, BMI of 30. So another really key area is thinking about virological failure rate. So 
There is, from this is from clinical trial data, there is a 1% risk, um, little, probably a little bit greater than 1% risk of failing cabotegravir um, real pivirine, and this is despite um, perfect adherence and despite um, drug levels within the therapeutic range. Um, so when you, and when you look at the people that failed in the drug trials, that, that effectively just over 1%, they failed with resistance, and that's with resistance in the integrase and within NNRTI. Um, looking at two monthly um, administration of cabotegravir will pivoting, there is an up to 2.5% risk of failure. Um, however, you can reduce that risk of failure. So that failure was seen in clinical trials, and when they looked back at all those individuals that failed, there were um, certain factors that increased the risk of um, confirmed virological failure, three of them being baseline, one of them not requiring a, a TDM. So those factors are having baseline resistance to wilpivirine, um, A6 or A1 genotype, having a BMI greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared, Additionally to that, people who um, had a low concentration, so still within the therapeutic range, but a low concentration of real pivoting at week eight also had a risk of, of, um, of virological failure. So thinking about um, ca what, what the current data is for cabotegravir real pivoting in children, so there are some simulated um, PK models that um, have been useful in predicting safe IM dosing for um, uh, phase two and phase three trials into, for, uh, for children. Um, of course, they have limitations, and they have limitations thinking through drug metabolism, role of transporters, um, drug diffusion through the lymphatic system, but they, they are, can be very good in, in, in for prediction. We, we will get um, data from CAB prep um, in adolescent girls from the extension of, of HBTN 084 and I'll talk about um, two um, other studies. So we have early data now from MOCA, and MOCA is a study looking at the safety and PK of long-acting cabral pivirine adolescents. So they reported up to, to, to week 16 at Croy, and it involves uh, 23 young people. Um, and just to note that the sites are all from the United States, and I've just highlighted um, the weight, and it, I think it, it just shows that actually the weight of these adolescents are effectively similar to those in adults, so the range being from 44 to 75 kilograms. So 23 adolescents living with HIV, these are um, individuals who are virologically suppressed on stable ART, and they continue on their ART through cohort one, split into two. One cohort gets um, four weeks of oral cabotegravir and then cabotegravir IM every four weeks. Uh, sorry, the first four weeks of oral lead and the other group the same, but with real pivirine. It's the same dosing as used in the adult trials. The um, uh, safety data has looked good so far, although it's very early, and effectively it's related to injection site reactions. There were two with um, discontinu discontinuations. Apparently one related to hypersensitivity to real pivirine, the other due to anticipated pain, so they didn't actually have the injection, but they were concerned about it, so withdrew. Um, and there was one reported grade three to cabotegravir related to insomnia. So this is just data two week 16 on, on the 21 adolescents, so still a small sample. But effectively, the PK levels for cabotegravir and real pivirine are mir mirroring those from Atlas Flare and Atlas 2M. So effectively, it looks good. Um, and I guess, sorry, just to say, it calls for, um, you know, there have been many reports um, that, that are calling to involve adolescents in, in adult phase three trials much earlier on and thinking about developing international agreed standards and this kind of moves that forward. Mocha also described experiences and um, uh, acceptability, which is, which is great to see, and it, it, it effectively they um, uh, took acceptability and experiences of why young people wanted to join these trials and involved 11 adolescents and 11 parents um, for, quality, for, for more in-depth data. When, when you look at just the, the, the basic questionnaire, I think it's interesting that all of the adolescents effectively said that they hoped not to take medication that involved pills. Um, the other themes were that uh, it, they wanted a, um, a pill-free regimen to avoid the stress of monitoring daily medication taking, not having to worry about hiding pills from peers, 
Um, concerns about maintaining a routine injection schedule despite being busy with school and extracurricular activities and moving um, to college, for example. From parents, it was interesting to see two quotes that, that highlighted they just wanted to feel happy their child was independent and not um, at risk given that they weren't taking their oral pills. And another child apparently was really pleading with their parent to join the trial because they were fed up of pills that the parent didn't really recognize as much. So CRAYON is a trial, a study that is due to start in children. We don't have any data on that, but that's just to highlight the basic study design. Uh, and this will be looking at um, safety, tolerability, PK, and antiviral activity of oral and long-acting cabotegravir puberine in children aged between 2 to 12, weighing from 10, 10 kilograms to 50. So is Latrovir, I'm not going to go through all, you, I, I, think, I understand you'll have access to these slides, so I won't go through all these points for is Latrovir, and unfortunately the development has been halted, but I did want to mention it because it was looking like a really exciting potential drug, and, and that was a drug within three contexts. So I, uh, is Latrovir um, contexts were that it would be developed as a oral daily pill with Duravarine, as a weekly long-acting oral pill with a new investigational drug called MK8507, and third, as a subcut or um, subcutaneous or implant for either treatment or prevention with another long-acting agent. Unfortunately, its development has been halted, apparently due to dose-related impacts on T lymphocyte currents, and I don't have any more uh, understanding on that. Again, briefly on MK8507, I won't go th through all these uh, points, um, but again, it, it, it's apparently a, it's looking like a long-acting novel NNRTI with a similar antiviral activity and resistance profile to Duravarine, but unfortunately, its development's been halted. So Fostemsevir, um, another first-in-class novel agent, it's not a long-acting agent, although we understand that um, a long-acting extended release formulation is being studied at phase one but it's a um, GP120 attachment inhibitor, first in class, already approved in the US, US and EU based on the BRIGHT um, phase three trial. It's aimed as a treatment for multi-drug resistant HIV as a once a day oral tablet. Um, we already have uh, model data that has provided dosing and PK sampling data for pediatric studies. And there's a Penta 22 Shield study that is due to um, be implemented um, looking at the safety PK and antiviral activity of, of Bostemsevir in combination with a optimized backbone regimen for children living with HIV and adolescents living with HIV who are currently failing their current combination. So moving on to long-acting drug technologies. So um, this wheel highlights a range of drugs that could um, enable administration of a long-acting ARV. The four main non-oral technologies are pictorially represented. And hopefully you can kind of see from the main image that if you have a suitable um, ARV formulation that can form either a depot in one of those skin layers or have a facilitated slow release through a micro needle or a patch. So PATH have done um, some, uh, some great work and are kind of seemingly leading the field in terms of microarray patches for diverse drugs, including antiretroviral treatment. Um, and they are keen to look at a patch that is self-administered, impregnated with nanoformulated ARV drug for sustained long-acting release. The aim being for it to, to provide discrete painless intradermal ARV delivery, either for treatment and prevention, to improve the adherence um, in children and populations challenged by daily regimens, uh, and in countries that may have limited infrastructure or personnel to manage um, injections. They've already looked at acceptability for microarray patches for PrEP in women and healthcare workers in South Africa, um, and already looked at key attributes that might be required for a patch for therapeutic use. So this was data from 2016 that looked at the, the acceptability of, of, of MAPS for delivery of PrEP among women in sub-Saharan Africa. There were 48 women, um, uh, sorry, in South Africa. There were 48 women who were interviewed across focus group workshops. Um, I think interestingly, um, there was a significant preference for the dissolvable vaginal patch compared to an adhesive patch thought to be more discreet and also there being a strong awareness of vaginal products compared to a patch. 
and there was um, uh, it seemed to be some some concern about whether an actual patch would work and how it works and really how discreet it would be in comparison. Um, moving quickly on, but just to say that there are um, there are also investigations of TAF subdermal implants and also potentially moving forward towards um, Dolly Chegare long-acting implants. We're still quite a bit away from those, though. So this is a table taken from the Pardo 2021 meeting, um, and effectively it highlights the pros and cons of different delivery systems for the pediatric groups, and, 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 a, and an important slide. Um, I think kind of if it, looking, looking at it, you can see that the long-acting subcutaneous appears to have more positive considerations across the groups. And, and more related to um, there being existing regulatory pathways um, for it, it's already used in, for other medications, an ability to dose adjust um, and being less painful than intramuscular. For microarray patches, there seems to be more potential or more understanding that it would be um, relevant for neonates and young children. Uh, and there are concerns around its size and um, required in the placement for older age groups. And then implants and intramuscular, conversely, most potential really for adolescents, given that you require a fixed dosing for them, um, and, but they are discrete. So just thinking about the current adult data and considerations uh, for children, um, there was actually a lot I could have fitted in there, but I kind of wanted to highlight the, those bits on the long-acting drugs. But uh, just one piece of data, um, only 54% of young people who begin ART achieve viral suppression, 6% maintain suppression long term, this is the United States of America. So novel long acting drugs and delivery platforms, they do have an ability to be revolutionary, but they do introduce novel challenges, obviously based on the drug and characteristics of the drug and the delivery system. So there looks to be good data for Cabotegaro, Wilpivirine, PK for adolescents. Matches adults so far, small sample, but that's looking good. But clearly there needs to be um, earlier phase three trials inclusive of all age groups when, um, when we have safety and efficacy data for adults. Um, and what are the concerns and, and wh why and where do we need data? So there are strong concerns really about the uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic um, relationship um, of drug metabolism and, and PK levels for children during times of rapid weight changes and the implications this will have in terms of efficacy, toxicity and resistance. Also SIP enzyme activity, drug metabolism enzymes for neonates and children, it's more complex. It's certainly not my area of field, but it's, it's, my, it's more complex. It's less predictable compared to adults and adolescents. So how will that impact dosing for new medications? Drug resistance developed despite drug concentrations within the therapeutic range. Now, they were rare, but we saw them for cabotegavir and wilpivirine and for lenacapavir in trial settings. How is that going to translate for children in lower middle income countries? Intramuscular, is that a limitation for young children with very low muscular mass, fixed drug required? How much volume do we need to go for, a drug, for, for that drug? We need that data. And genetic barriers, so cabotegravir, as Martina was commenting on, you know, cabotegravir, pivirine may not really be the right combination right now in terms of failure, and what is the context for children where there are higher prevalences of NNRTI resistance, and most importantly, no access or little access to VRT, even routine viral load monitoring. If you miss doses, drug concentration drops, what's the risk of failure and resistance? And then covering the long-acting drug tail, that's a conversation we could uh, really have a, a long one about uh, in terms of what the potential risks are about a PK tail. Um, so how, and another question really, and that we've already gone through a bit of those comments, but how translatable are these formulations to low and middle income settings? Thinking about genetic barrier of a drug versus the, the epidemiology of viral resistance in a given setting drug interactions, particularly with TB drugs in certain settings compared to others, clinic infrastructure, cold chain transport and storage, and what about our population living with HIV, thinking about poorer health status, muscle mass, managing adverse um, events and pharmacogenomics. There clearly is, when we get big data, um, the benefit of understanding what the population impact is versus the individual challenges. And I'd argue that you know, in high income settings, universal healthcare 
health systems that are more robust to manage individual challenges actually have a knock-on effect to the population benefit, and we need to think about those a little bit earlier. Um, and clearly, there's going to be a need for effectively centrally-led thinking about all the factors that our colleagues spoke about in terms of political will and barriers in terms of prioritization in settings for, to enable drug implementation of novel drugs. A really quick thing on, um, quick thing on health, health equity. So, um, you know, I always find it fascinating doing this work looking at the innovation in drugs, and it is, it is quite amazing, but there is advancement in certain areas compared to others, and we still have huge gaps in access to viral load monitoring, VRT testing, service infrastructure, healthcare worker education, universal healthcare. There are gaps there con compared to where we're going leaps and bounds in other areas. And in many ways, we all kind of are able to articulate it from our different environments on why. But there are commercial priorities and high income settings. Um, there is persistent lack of access to new agents in some settings. Many settings don't have Drunavir, Ritonavir access. In places like Indonesia, they've never seen integrase until Don Utegavir from 2020. Whereas in my setting in London, we've had so much experience of both those drugs. There, is, there are issues of national and government deprioritization and challenges with health systems. And I think we do need to think about how we embed equity in healthcare, or equality it should be, in healthcare innovation, in capitalized, um, capitalized systems. Thinking about community models of care and diagnostic support structures, you might have the innovation and the delivery system, but actually do you have the infrastructure to support its implementation? And can pediatric um, trials that we do, which are essential, can they be um, relevant um, for another setting? Can MOCA, for example, from the United States be translated to an adolescent population from Sub-Saharan Africa or South or East Asia? And thinking about patient barriers and healthcare worker barriers, barriers, we're seeing that now in London in terms of CAB and real pivoting. We have some physicians who are very pro it, others that are not. And actually that reflects what people are being told within the setting. Um, so just a quick question for you, actually. This is a slide taken from Pado about the um, prevalence of NNRTI resistance in children um, in South Africa. And the question really is now is, you know, if... if is, is, with the data we know, cabotegravir will be an option for, for children, for adolescents, for adults in the real world, in non-trial settings where we don't have access to routine clade, VRT, TDM, and clinic structure that supports clinic attendances and adherence. And I wonder, do we think it's yes? Do we think it's no? Do we think not sure we need more data? Thank you. Thank you so much for that really comprehensive talk. And I know it's a challenge to do all of that in such a short period of time. We have a very brief period for about two small questions. If there are any burning questions in the crowd, I see a hand up. We'll start with number two, Dr. Nachman. I just wanted to make one comment that MOCA has moved internationally now and it is fully enrolled, and we've included sites from Sub-Saharan Africa as well as Thailand. And number one. Uh, hello, my name is Tanaka Chirombo, the Y Plus Board Chair and the Youth Representative on the AIDS Conference Organizing Committee. My question is focused on the crayon uh, study you presented um, I was more interested in the weight-based regimen because in the pediatric sector, that's where I've noticed the, the source of virological outcomes and poor adherence comes from because a lot of uh, pediatric clients are under the, um, under the weight of 30 kgs, hence they cannot access single tablet regimens. So, so far, what are the developments in making sure that uh, the regimens are more suitable to pediatrics who are under 30 kgs so that they can also access single tablet regimens which have proven to be more effective in terms of increasing ART adherence. Thank you. Oh, um, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. It's a great question. I don't know if there might be someone who is with greater expertise to answer it. I was just going to add on the crayon team, the younger kids, it is all completely weight-based with strong PKs throughout the entire system, if that was your question. Any other questions in the 
Hi. Hello. Uh, Magda Conway, I'm from Penta Youth Engagement. Uh, two tiny, tiny points, comments, questions. Uh, one of them is, is there's also, and I'm the wrong person to talk about this, there's better people in the room, but there's a latter clinical trial which is happening, um, which we're part of, which is in Uganda, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Kenya, which is uh, recruiting at the end of the year, which is about long acting injectables in adolescence. And also what we're doing in there is we're talking to groups of adolescents from those different countries and having them involved. And I just thought it was really interesting. God, <laughs> out of breath. It's really interesting what you're saying about uh, the tolerability and also I think communicating with, the, with these communities because we've just started having some initial conversations. And although there was a huge kind of uh, preference to having injectables, when they found out where that injectable was going to be, uh, it, the conversation shifted massively and I think that we could probably as a community this community in the room I think we could probably learn from COVID about actually I think you're probably alluding to this in your talk about actually having those conversations with this community as we embark on this new medicine because it is revolutionary but we need to get them along with us Sorry. one short addition I started cabotegra or pivot in my clinic as a standard of care and I just want to highlight that shared decision making is extremely important. And message of you call you is extremely important in breakthrough of our emails. So I just want to echo what Magda said. We need young people at the table when deciding to roll this out in standard clinical care. Can I just comment, actually, I, I, if I've missed out anyone whose great work is out there, I apologize. I had to just kind of pick out some key bits to discuss and there may you know clearly be work out there that um, warrants um, discussion in this area so I apologize if I haven't covered it excellent well thank you so much this was really inspiring and innovating and looking forward to these changes <laughs>